A very good day to you, sir. A very good day to you, young lady. Who are you? Jamina? Ah, from me? Okay. So I'm Jamina. I'm from Blue Yellow. Yeah. Um, and now I'm doing this training project in Ukraine. Mm hmm. And what about you, sir? I go by Tex. Uh, I originally came to Ukraine back in February of last year to fight. And I had the honor to meet with Jamina and yeah. be a part of this training program. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to be one of the trainers. And I reckon it's not your true name, Tex? No. And I'm not asking for your real name. So uh, I was told you were a, an instructor these days in Ukraine. That's correct. What is that? Uh, as far as the, being an instructor, like yeah. what's that entail? Yeah. So uh, being an instructor with the Blue and Yellow training program, we train, advise, and assist. Uh, we try to make it as accessible to the units that require the training that's necessary. So we'll travel to their area of operations mm -hmm. to provide that training uh, and advising as well as assisting and planning of operations. So it's kind of like what it looks work like. work hand in hand with the local military. Absolutely. And with the Blue Yellow guys. Uh, what about the language barrier? Do you speak any Ukrainian or Russian? For I that speak matter? very little Ukrainian and Russian, but we do have translators that do an amazing job at translating and getting the point across. It's, uh, it's very important to, to know the language Absolutely. and speak without any translator, because you can, you can, can make it uh, not lost the, the momentum when you want to yell at somebody. To, I agree. To, to make a good impact. Yeah, but all the instructors are from NATO countries like mm -hmm. Scandinavia, USA, so they don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, so we need to use translators. You mentioned you came there a year and a, several months ago in February. That's correct. Did you see any action? Well, I yeah, you the, uh, start, I was fighting uh, in, in the Kiev area, Kiev Oblast, uh, in the beginning of the war. There was no foreign legion by that time. Uh, when I first arrived to Ukraine, uh, February 27th, there was no foreign legion. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after the foreign legion was formed, mm -hmm. uh, I was sent to Yavariv and I joined the foreign legion there. To yeah. where? Yeah. Yavariv. Yavariv. It's like oh. northwestern Ukraine. Okay. Uh, and then we deployed to Mashoun shortly after arriving. Mm -hmm. uh, Mashoun's like a small town, maybe about an hour and 30 minutes from Kiev. Okay. So you you were in Kiev in those very first hours of the invasion. That's correct. You saw a lot, I reckon. Yeah. What was the most terrifying or exciting thing to experience? Um, I don't think that there's anything really terrifying. Like I understood the the risks when I came, mm -hmm. so like I mentally was prepared for whatever was to happen. Uh, just was more focused on getting the job done, pushing the Russians out and pushing just them Just like a uh, simple inf infantryman, right? Uh, well, the job that we were tasked with was very basic in the beginning because we were just really, ma the main concern was securing Kiev mm -hmm. and pushing the Russians back so that Kiev could be safe. Afterwards, uh, we moved into more of like a special operations role, if you will. And we're talking about the 25th, 6th, and uh, depending. So I was, uh, I arrived on the 27th. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I, I didn't start fighting until March 1st. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you seen those, those bloody invaders? Of course. Okay. Many. D you sure, uh, I'm sure you know the, that abbreviation, the DRG, Diversion Rozidlne Grupa, those diversion scouts, you might call it. Those uh, the, the forward units consisting yep. of, of uh, three to four men. Yep. Have you seen them? Forward observers, yeah, of course. Okay. Yep. What about you? Yeah, I was not there in February. Mm -hmm. I was working here in Lithuania mm -hmm. because we had a lot of a lot of work, like donations started to yeah. come. So we had a lot of work here. So yeah, other people were go like, actually none of us like was going to Ukraine just to mm -hmm. Lviv, just to handle mm -hmm. stuff. And yeah. It's amazing. I mean, uh, did, you, did you monitor the situation uh, before the invasion? How did you learn about the whole thing? And why did you get there? What was the um, so I originally, I, I was aware of the situation in Ukraine since 2014, and I had been monitoring the buildup on the border. And why is it so? Uh, just because, like, I really believe that people should have the choice 
They should be able to have a democratic society, and they shouldn't, you know, have to worry about people or other countries coming in and trying to occupy and take what's theirs. I reckon when you hear anybody like Carlson Tucker or Roger Waters talking, you want to shoot them? I don't really watch the news. It's not my thing. That you've heard of Roger Waters? Yeah, of course. A very sick man these days, and I used to listen to his music when I was a teenager. And that's very strange, that's schizophrenic, as it appears now. So uh, the question is, uh, do foreign instructors of your type differ much uh, by nation? Uh, yeah, greatly. Can you talk about that more? Uh, I mean, if you could name any Western country, even not Western, you know, Eastern European, there's people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Australia, the UK, uh, Denmark, mm -hmm. everywhere. And who are those Ukrainians that you instruct? Are those uh, simple infantrymen or are these uh, officers or both? Uh, so mainly like our focus right now is dealing with the people who are going to be doing like the more specialized mission sets. And so we, we do anyone who requests any type of training, if we're able to provide it, we will. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we're mainly working with um, like the, the main director intelligence of Ukraine, uh, as well as like other special military units uh, and specialized police units that are being deployed for mm -hmm. Yeah, but also we did some like, basic training for people who are new in military, mm -hmm. and they didn't get enough training from the Ukrainian military, so we helped them to do that. Mm -hmm. Also, like snipers and other mm -hmm. special... Yep. So, uh, you've been in the army, of course. Uh, you, you're a former serviceman over the American army, or is it Marine Corps? No. Just like yeah. that? A firefighter, a policeman? No. no just, just like that. Yeah. So uh, talking about those differences, um, I mean, any, any instructor from, say, Britain or the Netherlands do their job differently, depending on the doctrines of, of their country's militaries? So we've kind of come together as a group, obviously, and set up standard operating procedures uh, so that there's no confusion across the board. So if I go somewhere or someone else, another instructor goes somewhere, the training is going to be uh, the same across the board so that there's a standard. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be kind of like a, a NATO standard. Mm -hmm. How many guys like him do you have to take care of, like a mother? <laughs> well, now we have like four or five are they good guys? Yeah, they're very good, good. guys. And we have a one like m main instructor who is like setting up all the all the plans on how how things mm -hmm. should be done. Yeah, so so far like four, but we are like we'll get more because we have a lot of requests from units to do the training, so we obviously need more. Is people. your organization uh, trusted by the local authorities? I mean, these guys are from Blue Yellow, so you can go anywhere, anytime, and you have the special badges, don't you? <laughs> no, we don't have special badges, but like we are working in Ukraine since 2014, so yeah. we have a kind of name there. People know us, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. And of course, it helps that like Lithuania. Lithuania oh, yeah. is very a magic word. Yeah, yeah. We've earned it. Yeah. Uh, tell me, Tex, uh, do you see any difference between between uh, an ethnic Ukrainian Russian? I mean, a loyal citizen who's eager to fight for Ukraine, but is, he's ethnically Russian and a Ukrainian. Do you see those little differences? Uh, as far as what, what, in what context? Mm -hmm. I mean, sh should I give you some context? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, oh, uh, in, what, in, in what a canteen or in a trench? No, every, everybody that you're fighting next to is doing the same thing that you're trying to do. It doesn't r matter really where they're from. A lot of the times there's a, a, a language barrier, an issue communicating, but we get the job done regardless. It doesn't matter where, okay. who ethnically they, they identify as, but everybody's got the same mission, and that's the most important part. You see, the reason I'm asking this question is, uh, is that uh, before 2014 and uh, before 2022, those local uh, ethnic Russians were different types. And uh, when the full-scale inv invasion began, many of them were converted overnight, and they became, had become true patriots of Ukraine. Yep. 
even though there were used to be tensions be between the two of those ethnic groups in Ukraine. And that's, uh, I mean, Putin has shot himself on the foot. 100%. He, he made this uh, political nation emerge out, yes. of, out of nowhere. Am I right? Have you noticed that? You're Lithuanian, you have to notice these things there. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, there is actually a like, difference. Uh, people who are like from Western Ukraine and like Donbas region, yeah. those Ukrainians or like native Russians. Mm -hmm. For example, those people that we work uh, who are like from Kharkiv or, yeah. or other, they speak Russian. Yeah. And they don't have any problem with that. Like Western Ukrainians are more like, we will speak Ukrainian and, and I will not speak and with you Russian. Russian yeah. yeah, but those people, like they're the patriots of Ukraine, but they're still like speaking Russian and they don't care about this. Like mm -hmm. still fighting for Ukraine, but they're Ukrainians, but they speak Russian because they were speaking Russian all, mm -hmm. all their lives. So like this is kind of difference. Yeah, okay. Well, a sensitive question. Uh, have you lost anybody who became, had become your friend? while training? Many people. Many people. Yep. How do you live with that? Uh, I mean, it solidifies my resolve. It gives me more reason and motivation to push forward. Whenever I think things are, are hard for me or, or the situation is getting tough, I just think that, you know, these people paid the ultimate sacrifice. A lot of the uh, foreigners, a lot of the guys that I fought with, um, you know, unfortunately were killed. Uh, we lost some guys in January in Bakhmut that were very, very close to me. Um, but I mean, it just, like I said, solidifies my resolve. I have no question, uh, I have no quarrels with doing what we're doing. And it just makes me more motivated. Mm. Because we, like, when we started to do this training project, it's because we see how many people die just because of lack of skills mm -hmm. or like bad leadership decisions. So we also like, we're not just doing training for basics, but we uh, advise and uh, advice how to plan operations and so on because we saw a lot of this just because of that and we lost a lot of friends and people just because of that so that's kind of like why we want to do this have you noticed any any uh, instances of uh, of complacency displayed by say senior ukrainian officers uh, telling you that we already know how to fight and all that stuff uh that's something like uh, that I think is probably in any military. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would say that there's cases of that, but I would say for the majority, uh, the, the people that are in charge, you know, they want this to be over mm -hmm. and they generally have the best interest in mind to keep the guys as safe as they can. Maybe not the full resource and knowledge to do so, but I think that in their hearts that they, that's what they want. Okay. Well, uh, the question number one in the air, Recently, as the the allegedly started uh, attack or counterattack, should I say? What do you know about this as of now? Uh, I know that a lot of uh, land in Bakhmut's been taken back. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that maybe the offensive is not in full swing, but it's definitely begun. Mm -hmm. Is it to be expected to be in full swing, uh, considering the fact that uh, during the Kharkiv operation and retake of uh, Hassan, there was no such thing? It was a, 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 it, it was of a very slow fashion. Um, I would say that it's going to be very different. There's a lot of people that are coming in with Western training. There's a lot of people that, uh, for example, that we've trained so that I know that they are deploying and therefore deployed now. And so I think that it's going to be a, a very big, a stark contrast from the beginning of the war. A lot of the people that were fighting in the beginning of the war didn't have access to the training or the supplies that would make them more combat effective. All of those, uh, not all of those supplies, but a lot of those supplies have now been passed down and the guys have had time to train. And a lot of the guys that are left right now are very senior and have a lot of experience. So mm -hmm. I think that you'll see a, a very big difference this year. Have you seen, and if you have, can you tell us about that, uh, any concealed, uh, say, rudder of a F-16 or F-35? Uh, no, I haven't no. seen anything like that. And you wouldn't tell us either? Probably not. Okay. Have you met any Russian POW? Of course, yeah. Yeah, Can we've taken POWs ourselves. Are they of same uh, behavior or do they differ? Have you talked to any one of them? 
Yeah, I mean, as much as you talk to someone like that, but uh, I mean, I, I wasn't really concerned with talking with them, just getting them back to the counterintelligence officers so that they could be questioned. Um, I, I mean, I understand, you know, what they're doing, and, you know, I have my job, they have theirs, so. But out of simple curiosity, didn't you want to ask them some questions? Why the fuck are you here, for instance? I mean, I understand why they're here. They're, okay. Yeah, or, ordered to be there, and and, and a lot of the times it's uh, they go forward, or you get shot by your own people. So I understand why they're there. So there's no question. Same reason that I'm there to to do my job. Okay. Uh, did you expect them to be that savage? I mean, Russians, that cruel, that savage. I think that I didn't. You didn't. I I, I thought that they were going to be a more modern military and that there's going to be, you know, uh, more humane rules. I mean, I know war is not humane, mm -hmm. but the things that happened, for example, in Bucha, yeah. uh, uh, in Irpin, where I fought as well. Have you seen those things with your own Unfortunately, eye? yeah. I saw a lot of civilians, uh, a lot of elderly children, you know, killed on the streets, their bodies left there, and uh, they have no weapons. They're not in any type of military clothing. One gentleman was still carrying his uh, grocery cart with food in it. Yeah. And so uh, I did see him. And again, that solidifies my resolve, and I understand that I can't leave yeah. until the job is done. Are you aware that Russians tell their people that these things were done by Ukrainians? 100%. Yeah, I understand that Russia is probably one of the best propaganda machines and that their people like to believe what the government puts out. You were born in Vilnius, right? Yeah. So you you had some Russian friends in in the yard. Well, yeah. The playground, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people spoke Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, neighbors and even like people my age, like small kids, they were from like Russian or like Polish, Russian, Belarus yeah, yeah. family. Russian speakers. Yeah. Well, it's a sensitive question these days here. We have to protect our Russians. Don't you find that? I don't know. Important. Huh? Well, I mean, as as long as people who are here in Lithuania who speaks Russian or they are Russian, but they are like loyal and mm -hmm. they like uh, see themselves as Lithuanian citizens. So that's, yeah, of course. What about you? And the same que question. Did you expect the Russians from Russia being that? Oh, cruel? yeah. I mean, I guess this is the difference from being from it's Lithuania. In our blood. Yeah, yeah. It's like, in our genes. like my grandmother was a partisan, mm -hmm. and she was imprisoned and tortured and deported. My, mm -hmm. like, all whole family was like that, like deported or yeah. other things. So I mean, for me, it was I, I was not surprised. So yeah, it's like the difference from people from Western countries. They they don't get it because they didn't. Yeah. Had this in history, so for me it was like I was not shocked at all. Tex, how do you imagine the end of this war, both politically and militarily? It's really hard to say, but I know that Ukraine will be victorious. You know that for sure. Yeah, I know it in my heart. The Ukrainian people will never stop fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, the regardless of the situation, regardless of the amount of supplies coming in, the aid that's coming in, I've seen the the heart of these people, and they're ferocious warriors. That's extreme patriots. Is it something that you didn't expect in a good way? Um, no, I, I kind of was hoping that that was the case. Um, and I, I mean, it was more so than what I thought. I thought, you know, of course, there's going to be patriots that want to fight. But I've, I've seen men, you know, my older than my father fighting and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, being shot and not refusing to, to be medevaced. Mm -hmm. So I know that these guys are, are really dedicated and they're yeah. going to get the job done. Uh, can you tell us your estimates, if you can, of about how many Ukrainians have perished in this fray? I mean, I don't have access to that information. Yeah, because there are very different numbers, mm -hmm. especially recently. Some say it's 10 to 17,000 Ukrainians lost. Mm -hmm. Some say a lot more. Do you know anything? I would that? say a lot more. A lot more. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, a lot more. <laughs> but uh, I'm talking about those dead. Yeah. But with it, combined with the injured, 
those figures must must be more than a hundred thousand. Yeah, but a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. What about the foreign legion? Is it diminishing or is it, uh, on the contrary, gaining some momentum? Um, in manpower, I mean. In manpower, I would say that uh, it's kind of plateaued right now. The so, uh, 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 plateaued. Like uh, we've reached a point where there's not a, a lot of people who are committed. They've came already. Yeah. Uh, so like, there's really not too many people that I'm seeing coming through that are new. But I do know that the, there are a lot of people who still intend on coming. I get messages myself all the time asking how they can, people can get over and, and enlist. So, mm -hmm. It's been a long time, more than a year, and uh, this cold breath of death, I'm sure you've, you've uh, experienced such things. When enough is enough for you? I guess maybe when I'm dead. <laughs> no. Don't speak like this. Yeah, seriously. Not on my show. Yeah. That's, I mean, uh, the people that, like, I've lost mean so much to me mm -hmm. that it, it doesn't bother me that that, that that could happen, that it's a high probability. Mm. Uh, but otherwise, I won't stop. How old are you? 29. Mm. Well, let's hope it's over soon. I agree. And a week or two. Uh, let's talk about uh, the American society. Is the American society ready for that type of warfare if it strikes out of the blue? I think that there's a lot of lessons that have been learned. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people who are in communication, obviously, with the Ukrainian partners, their counterparts in special operations, intelligence, foreign and domestic security. And I think that a lot, of, a lot of training and a lot of doctrine is transitioning for this type of warfare. It's like hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, the, the American people and the American military will be ready when the time comes, if it does. Uh, I, I bet a, a multitude of textbooks are being written right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree with the New York Times uh, name of its uh, recent article that uh, Vladimir Putin is the world's most dangerous fool? A hundred percent. I think maybe not fool. He's an intelligent man, but I think that he bit off more than he can chew this time for sure. Mm -hmm. And he's going to pay the price for that. It's been said he doesn't use the Internet. So that could be the reason why he's so... So deluded. Could that be the, the case? I mean, maybe he's drinking his own Kool-Aid per se, and he just really believes in, in what the mm -hmm. propaganda machine is putting out. Mm -hmm. But it's not the truth, and, and that'll show very soon, I'm sure. Okay. What is your uh, pace, should I say? I mean, uh, you take some time to recover here, as you are today in Vilnius, then you go back there. You, in order not to be overwhelmed by emotions and, uh, and exhaustion. Can you tell about that? Um, it's funny because we were just speaking about this, actually. Uh, really? we, didn't, we didn't come up here for vacation. We actually came to get supplies and a vehicle to go back down. So there's, in my mind, I don't, I don't need any vacation. Jamina's the same way. She's a workhorse. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the instructors are the same way. None of us have any issues uh, as far as, like, downtime yeah i would say that more so it's harder to be away than it is harder to be there okay yeah that's how you're going to tell or tell not your loved ones when it's over and you're back home um i don't think i'll i'll, I'll go back to the states to stay i think i'll stay in ukraine really 100 percent. really <laughs> yeah okay. which region then We'll see. I, I really like Kiev, but also um, Zaporizhia is a very nice area. The whole country is beautiful, mm -hmm. so I, I, I'll just, you know, find my place. Okay. Okay. Have you, have you learned anything about the Kiev and Rus? Or Rus, should I say Rus? The Kiev, Rus? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Yeah, some history. All, all, all the Ukrainians there are very, well, I mean, the Lithuanians as well are mm -hmm. very, uh, like, they understand the history. In the United States, I would say it's not the same, unfortunately. <laughs> so I learned a lot. You are a very young country, so you will, yeah. you will gain something of that yeah. sort in the future. Yeah. Well, 
Have you told this man already about our huge empire that was reaching the Black Sea shore? Yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> or all that, all that bullshit about our horses drinking salt water? Just now, but no. yeah, I, 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 I told him about that, yeah. Okay. What has changed in the Ukrainian military since the start of uh, Crimea, say, since 1914? Uh, 2014, sorry. 2014. Yeah. Um, I would say the quality of the soldier has changed. The motivation has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there's a lot of guys who wanted to fight back then that weren't able to, that now have that opportunity. I would also say that there's a lot of guys now that, that were fighting back then or who, who were partisans that are extremely experienced and in-depth with uh, combat. And I think that the big change is the combat effectiveness. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the unit, the small unit tactics, um, planning it's still they're still needing to learn a lot but i would say that the just the effectiveness the the ferocity mm. yeah i remember when a full-scale war started and we were working with some units yeah. before during the donbass war yeah. period they were like it was hard for them because they couldn't fight because it was like forbidden mm. and then once all started they were like they were not scared they were like happy finally i can fight Finally, I can do my job, and now they can do their job, and they're like happy about it, mm -hmm. and can use all the skills that they learn from all these nine years of war. Mm -hmm. Nine by now. Uh, is it? Uh, <clears throat> can we call this war the first drones war? Um, I would say like the off-the-shelf drone, yeah, because obviously the drones were used in the global war on terrorism a lot, but those are you more... You mean consumer off-the-shelf? You mean consumer drones? Oh. Exactly, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So I would say that that's the big change. Uh, you got to see a lot of innovation here, obviously, because of lack of supplies on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, drones in all fashions, yeah, I would say that this is it's going to set the tone for the future of warfare. Have you seen this uh, recent footage of a Russian soldier given up to a drone? Yep. It's not the first case. I, I do believe yeah, it. It's yeah. the first I saw. Yeah. And there, there are, I saw this uh, short film where, where a Russian infantryman is shooting back and then he shoots himself in the head. Have you seen these things? Yeah. I, I have a comrade that they took some POWs and one of the guys, the Russians, decided that he was going to pull the pain on a grenade and, mm -hmm. and take his own life. The others surrendered, of course. But mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, how much uh, different Russian units differ? I mean, there's this uh, Prigozhin, uh, uh, private company, uh -huh. military, and, and the regulars, the... the, uh, the Airborne troopers, the Santniki, what about them? So in the beginning, in Mashun and in Irpin, we were actually, that's who we were fighting was the Vidive. Vidive, so, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, and I would say that they were a lot more professional. Mm -hmm. And they were, they, you know, obviously they knew how to use small unit tactics. Okay. They knew how to maneuver and fight. Right. Uh, in Bakhmut, uh, seeing the Wagner forces, it's more just like human wave style attacks, non-qualified, not very qualified soldiers. I won't say that they don't have uh, qualified soldiers because they definitely do have some guys that are switched on. But I would say that the, uh, the VDV and some other units, obviously they're, they're special operations and they do a, a good job, mm -hmm. but we do ours better. Judging from how much of Red Bull you have drunk by now, you are too silent, Jimena. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you are not going to get back home after the war is over and you're going to set some ranchos in some Kiev or Zaporizhia district? Something like that. And uh, uh, go for hunting in the woods? Yeah, exactly. And for, for remaining Russians? Or for all that? I think for all of us, like Ukraine became like second home mm -hmm. because we are there all the time. And it's like, when I'm here, I want to be there. When I'm in Ukraine, it's like a lot of problems, a lot of stress, and I want to go back. <laughs> but when I'm here, I'm, again, I want to go back to Ukraine. So it's like... But in, in cities like uh, Kiev and uh, those uh, non-frontier cities, the life goes on, business as usual, right? In the front cities, life goes on. In Bakhmut, there's entire families living 
in, in the same area that we're living in the basement. Mm -hmm. uh, kids, moms, dads, grandparents, everyone's down there. They have their things. They make food. They live there. A lot of people refuse to leave. Like the resolve of the Ukrainian people is an incredibly strong thing, mm. and they they believe that But you know. Make, obviously, make no mistake. Some of these people are so-called zhdune, those waiters who are uh, loyal to the Russian military. But those are minorities, I believe. Yeah, it it, it definitely happens. It's, I mean, I've seen the same thing. We we were in fighting in uh, Severodonetsk back last year in June, mm -hmm. and, and I got to see a, a lot of people who <laughs> were c civilians mm -hmm. that would, you know, report our positions. And, mm -hmm. you know, people, it cost people's lives. Um, but obviously, like, we have our orders, and we're not, we're never been given orders to, to kill any civilians, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but they have the internal security service to, to deal with those people and prosecute them legally through the criminal channels. Mm -hmm. I remember one soldier told me, like, last summer, he told me that uh, why it was easier to fight in Western Ukraine, mm -hmm. just because there were a lot of people who helped them, like yeah, civilians, sure. uh, yeah. And he told me like that when they came back to the east, he was there like in Bakhmut since like, last summer. He said that I feel like occupant sometimes because there were a lot of people who were still like pro-Russian mm. or helping Russians. Mm. What is the rate of uh, what's the word uh, rotation for a say a, uh, a frontline unit? Uh, An ordinary Ukrainian unit, say, say a platoon. That, uh, probably that really depends. You know, that's that's like above me. Um, I, I could speak on on our side, but again, that's like something that's more like a, an operational security thing. So that you know, we don't really want to tell mm -hmm. kind of like when we come, when we go. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry for for asking. No, this no, is no. A stupid question. But there are people who are like there like every time. Uh -huh. yeah. I know some units that we work since 2016. They are like there yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel uh, the this influx from countries such this country, the Lithuania? I mean, uh, influx of help, both uh, in money and equipment. Oh yeah, it's made a huge. I, I tell Jimena all the time. Um, Before we worked together, she was helping me in my unit, of course, in other units as well that I have friends in and they needed things. And mm -hmm. I could say without a doubt, the, the material and the monetary aid has saved lives. It's, it's not a joke. It's not an over-exaggeration. Mm -hmm. And without that, um, you know, a lot of lives would have been lost. Mm -hmm. Are you tired of all this? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. If you have Everyone books, is tired. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, this this I learned from Ukraine. <laughs> I sh I'm somewhat sure you won't get back to this country when everything's over. You will live next to him somewhere in Ukraine. I I, I don't know. I never thought about it. Yes, you have. No, I actually I, I don't want to live in Ukraine <laughs> for <laughs> my whole life. I don't know. I like Lithuania. Uh -huh. I like it here, but and I don't know. It depends on mm. circumstances. <laughs> Let's talk about politics. What do you think about China? Um, I mean, obviously, China's a, a global power. Mm -hmm. I think that they made the wrong choice in providing aid to Russia, but they have their long-term vision, their 50-year plan on where they want to be. And I think that they have their own internal issues as well. Um, but, I mean, maybe that'll be the next conflict, China-Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see. So it's very important to win this war to show China exactly. who's the boss. Have you encountered anything Chinese in the field? I mean, anything from hand grenades to... to uh, all the drones that they're using are made in China. All, yeah, but those are consumer products. Exactly. Yeah, it's still coming from China regardless. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the grenades, like military, you mean? Yeah. No, like sure. weapons and stuff? No. Yeah. Firearms, no? No. We saw it. You did? Yeah. Uh, Jonas, Jonas saw it. He mm -hmm. has a picture from, I don't, I don't remember which, but it was a grenade, I guess, or mm -hmm. something. I don't remember, but it was made in China. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know anything about Belarus? 
I mean, as a nation, a neighboring state? Not too much. Mm -hmm. It's a strange thing. Both Ukrainians and Belarusians are, so, so to say, of uh, the same fate, but they've yeah. chosen such different paths. There's a lot of Belarusians that are in Ukraine right now fighting for their country. By, yeah. by fighting this Well, fight. you can't say how many, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I couldn't give you an accurate estimate anyways, but there's a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and they're ferocious warriors. And mm -hmm. they explain to me a lot that the reason that they're fighting here is to, for the fate of their country, for the, what, what will happen in the future of their country. They're going to enter Minsk victoriously. Yep. Godspeed. Yes. Well, that would be a good thing to experience. I think we, we will in our lifetime. 100%. And this man, Lukashenko, is set to be sick recently. I've heard the same things about Putin. Oh, <laughs> that's not the case, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he's, uh, he's a very strong man uh, health-wise, I mean. He will die the last. He will be the last man dying on, on this planet. Let's hope not. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Well, uh, the thing is, I, I think that uh, Putin is just the consequence. And the reason is the Russian society. Have you ever pondered on these things? Yeah, uh, I watched and read a lot about Putin and his rise to power. Have and, you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and the corruption and mm -hmm. everything that he's done. How there's estimates that he's, you know, one of the richest men in the world with a lot of, you know, hidden wealth. Mm -hmm. mm, but I mean, it's I don't know. I don't know really what to say. I'm. Uh... I'm convinced, I'm sure, that he's got some red room somewhere in the corner, in the, the, the most secret corner of the Kremlin, where he keeps this long, long revolver uh, with, in, encrusted with, with uh, gold and, uh, and diamonds. And he dresses up like Freddie Mercury when he's alone, <laughs> and he dances with that revolver. Don't yeah. you think? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, if you have something to say uh, to, to boost our morale here, so be my guest. Glory to the heroes and glory to Ukraine. Can you say that in Ukrainian? Hrom Slava. Hrom Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, take care of yourself. You take care of him. And uh, and you take care of her. Of course. And, uh, I mean that. Be, be, be come victorious and in one piece. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.